Hello to everyone out there. This is another episode of Fanatsu. Wahui host me, Zutalus. I am your host once again. And I am very happy, very happy, and very proud uh, to have as my guest for today's episode, Iprimuhu, my cousin, Alfred Pereiro Flores. Um, who is a scholar, who has, um, who is a scholar. We've known each other for a while. We've worked together on amazing projects in the past, but I'm very excited that he is here with me for Fanatsu to talk about his new book just released in the past few months, The Tip of the Spear, focusing on militarization and immigration in post-World War II Guam history. And Enigi, there's Alfred Hafadei. Hafadei. Hafadei Maget. Hafadei Maget. Thank you. Masi, thank you again for having me on Fanatsu. It's an um, honor to be here. Um, I'm humbled that I had to be over here to share space with you and everyone virtually, even though this is a pre-recording, but I appreciate everyone who tunes in later on. No, hagumas, hagumas. And so let's get started with, for everyone who comes on Fanatsu, because one thing that I like to do is is really just try to expand our definition of what a Chamorro is. Because for some people, they say, mm-hmm. oh, you're only Chamorro if you're Catholic or you're only Chamorro if you work on the ranch mm-hmm. or this or that, you know. But for me, it's like, no, there's hundreds of thousands of Chamorros, many of whom were not born in the Marianas, live elsewhere in the world and have very different experiences. And so this category of Chamorro, we got to find room for lots of people. We got to make sure that as many people with a diversity of experiences can connect. And so that's why for me, one, you know, one of the things that's important is that, you know, diaspora, home islands, we all find ways to connect. And so I want to give you the chance to share sort of, a, you know, what is your Chamorro experience? Um, you know, in the diaspora, in the islands, what is your Chamorro experience? Yeah, no, so, I mean, I'll start with, you know, start off with by, you know, doing what we customarily do, which is to introduce, you know, like my family, you know, so um, I come from family in Kulu, from my Prado side, so from the village of Dotnia, and then from my uh, father's, uh, from my grandfather's side, uh, our family in Cabeza, from uh, village of Totu, so, um, you know, that's my uh, grandparents, and then on my mother's side, um, that were Kim from Korea, so South Korea, um, from the city of Seoul, that's where I was actually born. And so, um, you know, I always feel like, you know, it's kind of, I always feel when it comes to the question of diaspora, you know, whether it's, you know, from the Chamorro perspective or experience or another Pacific Islander perspective or experience or, you know, any other indigenous person, the thing that I always um, think back to is that it's kind of like how we think of um, even the Pacific or Pacific Islander. A lot of times the way I define it is it's not just um, a place-based identity. It's also a people-based. And what I mean by people, it can encompass like culture and practices, and, or in this case, custom brand Chamorro. And so it's that genealogy and lineage, you know, regardless of where you're at in the world, that also make you Chamorro, right? And so I think um, it's a thing that is a part of um, us all when we think about all these different things, whether it's where you live, where you're from, where your ancestors are from, even where you're at, because you know, there's so many um, important principles that I think define who we are as Chamorro people. Like you said, it could be Catholicism, it could be, you know, um, cultural practices, it could be language, right? These are all, there's all kinds of ways to define ourselves. But the thing is, when we live in the world that we do today, there's so many things that pull us in different directions that might result in us having to live in different places and in different times of our lives. And so, and, and sometimes those principles um, or sometimes those factors that pull us could, you know, put some of those principles that make us who we are as Chomo into tension, into contention or makes it contention. So if, you know, obviously being connected to, you know, the Mariana Islands, Mariana Islands is like a part of who we are as, as our identity as being, that's being our, our kin, right? The Mariana Islands. But also if, you know, being close to family, being close to, you know, and then, you know, being close to family and say your family no longer lives in the Mariana Islands. So, you know, to have a person that's Chamorro have to make a decision between living near their, you know, entire family or their, you know, or their nuclear family that might be like, you know, in the continental U.S. versus being back, you know, um, in the Mariana Islands is a difficult decision for someone to have to make, right? So it's like, if those are the, 
if those are the principles that make us who we are in terms of loving our family and custom branch moral and the obligations and responsibilities that come with caring for our family, but also too being in relationship in proximity to our homeland and our home, our home island, that's a tough choice to make for some, for some people, right? For everyone. And so, and it also changes during that uh, particular period of time. So it's at some moments, you know, you might be closer to home. In other moments, you know, you might be further away. But I think most importantly, you have to be, you know, you have to be willing to identify yourself as Chomoro, right? If you do that, I think that's always like the first step to make to being able to make sure that you're always anchored and tethered because that's the entryway. Like when as long as as, as soon as someone stops identifying themselves as being right Chomoro, then that's when you know you're less likely to be that, right? So. Um, sorry, I'm kind of like rambling. I apologize no, no. to all the viewers up front. It's, no, it's like no. 10, it's 10, it's 10 p.m. Spent, over here on the Pacific. I just put my kids, I just put my kids to bed. <laughs> Basta no, primo. No, 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 no. As, as I told Alfred here, as I told Alfred here, Guiza e guest, he's the guest. And so he gets to ramble as much as he wants, as much as he wants. Um, but I do want to I do want to thank you, though, for sort of the way you're talking about tomorrow identity, because, you know, as me for somebody who who still, you know, is out there, however I can, like teaching the tomorrow language. It's one of those things where it's a it's a delicate thing because you the majority of the tomorrow people, more than 80 percent of the tomorrow people cannot fluently speak their language anymore. And so it's this delicate thing, because on the one hand, you don't want to make those who cannot speak feel like because they can't speak they are not Chamorro or that there's something wrong with them but at the same time you want to encourage them and say mm -hmm. that you know what if you can learn your language then it's it means it's a part of your identity a part of your heritage that mm -hmm. you can't you can't replace with no matter how many t-shirts or tattoos and I have lots of t-shirts and tattoos that say mm -hmm. the word Chamorro on them but so it's that thing where you want to, you don't want to define yourself in a way where you, you know, disempower yourself, but you also want to always define yourself in a way that there's room for inspiration and growth and possibility. So that's what I, I liked about the way that you were defining it. It's very real. You know, it's, it's very real. It's about sort of the reality that we live in. Um, but yeah, so Sidus Masi for that. Thank you. And then, like you said, you know, like, I mean, and I won't deny it, like the language to me is the baseline, you know, that is like the baseline because there's certain things that we learn through language, right, that cannot be translatable into other languages. And so that is truly the baseline to being able to have a, a strong foundation in, in your culture. And so, um, but I'm always really inspired by all the different ways that other Indigenous groups and other people, Indigenous people, you know, um, also exercise, like you said, those different forms of identity, right, of that, of that indigenous identity. And it comes through practices, right? It comes through a responsibility and obligation and how you kind of embody and live those things on an everyday basis. And so um, those things can happen, right, without always, you know, without having to always be in your home, in your homeland, right, in your home island. Um, so, uh, yeah. And so let's, uh, I wanted to give us a chance here. So to let's talk about islanders and chamorros in academia and so mm -hmm. i was looking i was going through my photos and i came across this one <laughs> and, uh, this was man were, were we ever oh, that young was my hair ever that long <laughs> man look how look how look how young we look oh my god it's like yeah was it like we're like 20 pounds lighter in those photos <laughs> yeah probably oh man <laughs> But so this is, of course, uh, Alfred and I, and then, you know, uh, M Madel Narangas, uh, who was one of my colleagues in the Ethnic Studies program at UCSD. We are both in the same PhD program. And so this is for the NPINE, the National Pacific Islander Education Network Conference, one of those conferences that I always used to go to um, in Long Beach, usually in Long Beach uh, when I was in grad school. And so, you know, it was actually the, the first time that we connected, I believe it was at an Pine conference. That's right. That's and right. so it was, uh, for me, sort of, this was a very sort of community-based conference. It was not like a, you know, it's not one of those where sort of like the, you know, the, the people with the Guggenheims are going to go and, and, and hang out and, and talk and stuff like that. It was, 
it was something which was much more community-based. There is Dr. Victor Thompson, who was Samoan, who helped organize it. And it was a lot of like, you know, Pacific Islander faculty who, and grad students, you know, and faculty at like community colleges or who, who were just wanting to help, you know, who were working with populations and wanting to get more people up into higher education. But, you know, this was, for me, this was a, an interesting experience because growing up in Guam, I never really called myself Pacific Islander. I just called myself Chamorro or Guamanian or mm -hmm. a local or Islander. And then coming into the States and then realizing that there's a larger category that we fit into, but it's also a contested category because mm -hmm. some people say it's Asian American Pacific Islander, American Pacific Islander, or you know, there's all these, what is it, AAPI, AA, whatever, you know, all this mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then also finding that even though there is that category, there's issues in terms of erasure within that category too. And so mm -hmm. it was a, it was a very interesting experience, at least for me. But I do want to ask you though, as, you know, as somebody who has, you know, you're a Chamorro in academia, but you're also a Pacific Islander as well. What has your experience like sort of um, in terms of finding space, in terms of finding community? Because I can tell you that um, I was, I felt fortunate in my PhD program that there wasn't a lot of pressure to like not cover Chamorro things or not research Chamorro things. But I know other uh, Chamorros who are in programs graduate programs where they're kind of told that no you this is not going to get you work or it's not going to get you published or who cares about this you should write about a bigger ethnicity or or one of the things that was common was this idea that oh yeah you can talk about Chamorros but only if you compare them to an ethnicity that people care about do something mm -hmm. across you know cross-cultural comparative where you compare Chamorros and Native Hawaiians or Chamorros and Puerto Ricans and so I wanted to get your experiences because you've uh, you've been through, you know, grad school, you know, your 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 tenure track, you're going up for tenure now, uh, you know, and then you've put out your book. And so what has your experience been like as a Chamorro, uh, as a Pacific Islander in academia? Yeah, no, I, I would say that in a lot of ways, uh, my start into, um, you know, even into the, if you want to call it right, the like the field of. Pacific Islander studies, you know, is a lot of a lot of ways rooted in the kind of uh, lack of presence that um, that was um, um, common at that time period, right? So, you know, when I was in grad school, it was like probably 2004 when I started. So, you know, at that time, you know, in 2004 in the continent, there wasn't a lot of PI faculty that you could go and you know and basically um, be advised by you know Pacific Islander faculty who were in positions of like at least tenured positions, right? There might have been some tenure track, but, um, you know, so there was a lot of that, right? Like that was like the impetus for me to want to, you know, really hope expand and bring visibility, you know, to Pacific Islander Studies just broadly, because it was my experiences as an undergrad and an early grad student where I learned, you know, about ethnic studies as a field and um, as a discipline. And, um, you know, it really showed to me that um, our stories, matter you know our stories our histories you know our experiences they matter and they tell us something about the world they also you know can help reorient and teach people you know in other societies and other communities things that you know i think is also right applicable to their own experiences that they can see the mirrored experiences and they can see the, the usefulness that you know like like the utility behind like our stories being told can like, you know, help inform their own communities, right, in ways that I thought were also really important. So, you know, like that was like the, you know, like the, the, my entry into it. And so, you know, I think, you know, over over those years, you know, especially since early on, you know, I wasn't um, in my graduate program when I was at UC Riverside, you know, the majority of my faculty members were Native American. You know, they were like, you know, they're Native American faculty, which who, you know, did a great job. I mean, they gave me such great mentorship in just thinking about Native studies and Indigenous studies, you know, and, and giving me that grounding. But they too also knew that there was limitations on how much they could advise me because, you know, they didn't know the communities, they didn't know the archives, they didn't know the organizations, you know, they just didn't have that, you know, um, research experience to help gu like guide me. So that's kind of like why they encouraged me and I left UC Riverside. And so, you know, um, I think, 
as I, you know, as time went on and as I, you know, went to UCLA after that, you know, and I was working with, you know, Keith Camacho there. And then, you know, there was Vince, obviously Vince was already, you know, a tenured professor at University of Michigan and Amy Stillman and Damon Salesa, right, were over there. So, you know, there were, you know, faculty members there that, you know, I think um, were helping to also build Pacific Honor Studies. But, um, you know, and so, you know, those early years were tough because, you know, you it was always about the question of, uh, the question I always received was like, well, well, why is it significant? Why is Guam important? Why is Guam important? Like, why should people care? And I think that's a question that gets asked to probably most grad students, right, when they're doing a dissertation. But I always kind of felt like there was an extra, you know, emphasis for like, you know, when when it was asked to me and other people who might be studying like smaller communities or smaller places. And so, um, you know, I think that was a question I felt like it was always kind of stronger or more imposed upon when I, it was always asked to me to do that. So, and I think that's also reinforced in the discipline I was in, which is history. You know, in history, we're all, they're always asking the question about scale. Like, you know, what is the, you know, why is, you know, Guam important, you know, when thinking about this larger region or larger places? And not that those questions don't matter, because they do. You know, and I think that is also one of the ways we can tell, you know, um, a larger story about our own island history, right? Our own, on the, on the Mariana Islands histories. And so um, that, course, that, you know, that question is important, but at the same time though, you know, um, that also kind of reinforces the, well, why should anyone care about Guam question? And so for me, you know, um, I always try to make it legible for people to see like how Guam fits into, Guam fits into these you know, larger histories and larger stories. But at the end of the day, you know, my, uh, my other commitment is really about the liberatory politics of the work that we're doing to really, you know, push like the narratives that we have, like the tip of the spear narrative, like America's Day, where America's Day Begins narrative, the liberation of Guahan narrative. Like these are all the things that actually, um, I, you know, that's like, to me, I more, I more care about like, you know, the liberatory politics and like addressing those narratives that most people know about Guahan when they, you know, hear it on the news. Right, usually in usually in reference to like North Korea or China, right? Like that's that's usually when it mostly comes up in like you know mainstream media. And so um, that's like my commitment really there is to like try to show people, you know, at the end of the day that you know there was a different world in Guam in Guahan before World War II. You know, yes, the military was already there, but that world that Ch Chamorros lived in and other people on the island who were not Chamorro living in Guahan before World War II. That's a different, after World War II, it's a different place. It does become, in some ways, a different place, you know, mm -hmm. just from the physical, right, the environmental and physical, and even like the social and cultural, you know, dynamics of the island, you know, change over over time. And World War II has a lot to do with that. So, oh, very true, but, very true. Uh, very true. But the final thing is like, I uh, the final thing I want to ask is like, I think though now it has become, there has been a large improvement. I think today, you know, we see as a as a professor now, you know, I see colleagues in, you know, um, Asian American studies. I see colleagues in, you know, Native American studies, you know, that have become like allies, you know, for, you know, and, and space makers for Pacific Islander faculty and Pacific Islander issues. And so, you know, I think it's situational, though, you know, it depends on the departments, it depends on the institutions. But, um, you know, if you look at if you look at across the continental U.S., you'll find, you know, Pacific Islander studies, uh, Pacific Islander faculty in different types of departments. Sometimes they're in American Indian or Native American. Sometimes they're in Asian American departments like I am, right? I'm housed in the Asian American studies department, you know? So it just depends on, this, on the space, you know, um, where you find that those kinds of um, allyships with, you know, other faculty who are concerned with also, right, um, um, promoting and, and helping to grow the field of Pacific Islander studies as allies. No, I would definitely agree that even just in in the time of like our our grad school academic life, you can definitely see the difference. I think um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's I think there's definitely still improvements that could be made. I mean, I was just talking to this past week to uh, one one Chamorro who's working on sort of their manuscript, and it was just kind of like a, and it was it was interesting because they were asking me you know, if I was writing about African-American history, would I have to give all of this background that sort of that like editors are telling him he has to do for writing about Guam? And I'm like, no, 
probably not i mean probably mm -hmm. not because that's that's part of it is um you know you could call it colonial you could call it part of being from small islands you could call it all of what it, how, whatever you want to term it but there is just that we are constantly required as islanders that that have this colonial experience to constantly reintroduce ourselves to the united mm -hmm. states and so it was kind of like a it was like yeah you kind of have to do it but if you're and it's just it really is just because the conversation around the islands in relation to the United States is it's so tenuous and small, you know, so and it's defined, uh, it was defined for a long time by Moana. Uh, and then before that by Elvis. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's defined by these certain things. And, and in and what's what's fascinating is that it's also defined by by military, sort of by mm -hmm. military value, although not although in 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 strange ways in strange ways and so let's let's move into that now though because your book you know your book and your research you know talk about militarization and immigration and you know chamorros live militarized lives that's just the reality whether it comes out because you are a family in which you have been dispossessed from land because of military bases that are there now it could be because, you know, that your family lives elsewhere in the United States because of migration patterns that are determined by military service, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of ways. Guam is an island in which 29% of it is U.S. military facilities, and the Marianas are the home to what the United States calls its playground, one of the largest training areas in the world. Yeah. And so... So we live militarized lives, but if you try to talk to kind of uh, like your uncle or your aunt or your aunt about like militarization, though, they'll be like, oh, boy, what's that? You know, what's mm -hmm. militarization? Is that a, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, Hungan, that's the that's the new movie on Netflix, right? Militarization. Oh, yeah, too, Ega Trebi, I haven't watched it yet. But so, but we should, I, you know, I'm always looking for ways to us to think for us to think more about what this force is that impacts our lives, has impacted our ancestors' lives, impacts our lives today. And so I wanted you to kind of break down, like if you were kind of talking to to, to your average Chamorro about what militarization is, uh, what, what would you tell them? Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? Yeah, no, I try to give, like, like, you know, to me, the simple definition that I kind of adhere to is like the militarization is the process of military making. And that military making could be the building of bases. That military making could be the building of war memorials. That military, you know, uh, making could be the construction of roads, right? And so, you know, I, this is where, like, you know, the work of like David Vine, you know, is really helpful for me, is because, you know, he talks about how military bases. If we think about bases being more than just an actual physical base, that we look at all these other things that are part of the military, then it gives us a greater sense of like the ubiquitous, the pervasiveness of, right, like how you, everything is like a mili part of our militarized lives, as you said, right? And so, you know, like that's what I define it as, is like that process of military making. But, you know, it over also overlaps with the idea of like militarism, right? Which is like the discursive element, is like the ways, like you were saying, also how people just, you know, in their everyday lives just, you know, think of it as something that's simple, that, you know, that they pass by in every day, or it becomes part of like the everyday logic of like, for example, you know, oh yeah, the military is here and, and the military brings our safety, you know, and national security to Guam, when, you know, to Wuhan, when we also know that the other narrative is that it also brings, you know, insecurity and danger and the possibility of war, right? That's like one of the things I say in my book is that like as many activists and organizers and researchers have been saying too, is like, you know, right before, even before me is that, you know, actually we need to reverse the narrative and think about how that presence actually brings, you know, the possibility, you know, and where, you know, the possibility for that war to happen. And so, you know, these two things, you know, throughout the book, I kind of sometimes use them interchangeably when I'm talking about militarism and militarization. Part of it is because, you know, the discourse and the mil and and the materiality is sometimes one and the same, right? Discourse is material, is material, you know, and so um, the discourse can be is 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 also material, and so sometimes that's why I use. You know, I might use something interchangeably like military, militarism and militarization, but 
quite generally, that's the way I kind of tell people. It's like the process, that process. But that process isn't just one step, right? I mean, we're thinking about the process, the military making militarization is that process. That process includes a, a number of things, you know? And if we're thinking about World War II, that process included the, you know, gaining access or obtaining land. You know, if that land wasn't already occupied, it was obtained in some kind of way. And, you know, sometimes through legal measures, sometimes, sometimes through coercive measures, right? Sometimes just outright deaths, right? When we look at the history of, of the island. And so, you know, that process is one step, you know, but then it has to also be made with another step, which is who's going to then work that land, right? Who's going to be the, the laborers that actually till that land, that convert that, uh, that jungle area into a, a, a airfield? You know, and then where are those supplies going to come from? Where's the materials, you know, the materials and supplies and the tools are going to come from? So, you know, it's like really this broader infrastructure and that's part of this process that I call, you know, like military making or militarization. So. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Because I, I think, uh, yeah, I, 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 I remain continually surprised at how Chamorros can live such incredibly militarized lives, but also, and and be kind of in their own ways, kind of proficient experts in the lexicons of militarization. And then also, but just kind of, like you said, have it be so naturalized. You know, I, I always remember uh, what Robert Underwood said once that, uh, you know, in Guam, a uh, uh, military fence is, can be as common as a coconut tree in which mm -hmm. you would not question a coconut tree being there. And so you, many people don't question a military fence being there either. Yeah. And so it's, so for, you know, for me, it's, it's just such an interesting thing because, you know, my life, for example, is definitely impacted by it. But at the same time, I'm also somebody where, you know, my grandparents didn't go into the military and then me and my siblings, none of us went into the military. And so we don't have the same poles that a lot of people do because I was just thinking for example like how how on a daily basis I will hear somebody say oh you know I need to you know oh I want to have a party for for my godchild but I, I need to get on base so I can I can get the cake mm -hmm. or oh yeah yeah oh I need gas I need to go on base to get the gas and so just the ways like you were saying taking it away because one of the things that that I think is important about using these broader terms for understanding these forces of life, uh, which are material and discursive, as you said, is to get it away from the idea that so many people have that, you know, military stuff in that, in that way, when you talk about it, it's only if it's a bomb going off or a country mm -hmm. being invaded and then forgetting that there is such incredibly massive infrastructure that makes mm -hmm. all of that happen. And all and a lot of it may be completely unknown. It may be behind fences. It may be underground, right? And so um, understanding then like our role in that and how it how it affects our lives, especially mm -hmm. for those of us, I, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, especially for those of us in the Marianas where so much of our, even our economy is dictated by by military benefits by military perks, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, there's so many insidious components, right? That uh, that are uh, part of that are part of this structure of power that are functioning. You know, so that's why, I like, um, you know, for me, you know, in this book, and one of the things that I always try to tell um, folks when, you know, I'm uh, talking about the book is that the book isn't a critique of, you know, any individual. You know, it isn't a critique of Chamorros in the military. It isn't a critique of Filipino, you know, workers who built the bases. The, the main critique is on the structure of power that's been basic of settler militarism or, you know, settler colonialism or militarization, you know, whatever term that, you know, people are using to describe it. It's the critique on this structure of power that's at yeah, play that is, you know, a lot of ways, um, you know, shaping the lives of all people. You know, that's the thing, you know, like I, you know, I, and I, and I, you know, obviously, you know, I keep in touch with like, you know, you and other folks, you know, you know, through social media and other ways, right. Where I've been able to like, you know, keep in, keep abreast or like when I would go last time when I went back, right. Like, you know, um, back in 20, I think 
19 when I was there last time. But, you know, like when I go back to, you know, um, it's just like, it's the, it's, it's the thing that, you know, we, you know, we as a, a broader community, right, are always trying to tell people is that like, you know, all of these things are not just impacting Chomos, it's impacting everyone who lives there. So everyone should be concerned with like settler colonialism. Everyone should be concerned with militarization because whether it's indirectly or directly, your life is being impacted in some kind of way. Sometimes it's more clear to us because it's right in front of our face, but other times it's buried behind a fence and it's leaking, you know, oil and gasoline into the under, uh, underwater um, aquifer and the underwater, um, you know, table, right? Like Red Hill, for example, like in Hawaii. So like there's, you know, all these ways that, you know, um, lives, right? Everyone's lives are impacted. It's just sometimes more, you know, overtly and sometimes it's not. Oh, again, Sidhu Smasi, Sidhu Smasi. Let's get into your book right now. Yeah. And okay. I am a, I am so proud of you that you were able to, Thank you. Or, you know, you went through all the work, you know, uh, to get this done, to get this out there. And it is, it is an impressive book. It is an important book. It fills in so many of the, it, it fills in important gaps. You know, this is um, just for somebody who studies and has written about Guam history, but I can tell mm -hmm. And for, I can tell all of you watching that part of the, you know, part of the period that's covered in this, the post-war, immediate post-war years, when so much of how the island is today is decided, whether somebody makes a plan or whether it just happens, but in terms of what the island will look like, how it's going to be, it's in those years, but because it falls in this point, in this gap between liberation and the Organic Act, it's, it becomes where this part where even a lot of people interested in history just don't think about it because you have the big moments, liberation from the Japanese, and then, oh, we're U.S. citizens six years later. But there's so little about what happens to the island, um, you know, what happens to the island in terms of the post-war, the Guamanian era, as Guampedia calls it, sort of being created. And so... The book, The Tip of the Spear, Land, Labor, and U.S. Settler Militarism in Guahan, 1944 to 1962, is published by Cornell University Press. So if you go on the Cornell University Press website, and if you use the code, and I'm going to put the code also on the live stream so people can get it, 09EXP40, 09EXP40, then you can get a discount on it. And it, it's good too. I mean, support the estate Samaruta and I support our Tetlu here. You know, as Cornell Press knows that they they, you know, that they picked a winner with this <laughs> with this book. Hungan and so put for both 09 EXP40 is the is the discount code. Um, this is the hardcover version. And so um please support, get a copy of this because if you are somebody who really wants to get into our post-war history, the post-war history of the island. Um, and the thing is, you know, I've uh, I've interviewed lots of people. This is a lot of the stuff covered here is stuff that people only talk about in in specific ways or, or skip over entirely. Like, you know, for example, people that are uh, descended from the, the foreign laborers from the Philippines, they have their narratives in which they talk about their experience, but it's almost always completely disconnected from other narratives of the time. And so what's great about this book is that it brings different narratives, which in the community and in scholarship, people have talked about separately. And then it brings them together in a way to try to make sense of this time. And so, okay, I want to give you the chance now, put for what, go ahead and give us the, I was spoiling a little bit because that's the part that I'm excited about, but <laughs> Tell us, sort of, give us the the broad strokes. And remember, this is your hour on Finanzo, so you can take as much time as you want to just, to just lay out what is the book, what are the main points from the book that you'd like people to know. Well, thank you again, uh, Pimu. So, um, no, um, yeah, the book, you know, the main argument of the book is, or I should start with just kind of, you know, like I mentioned a little briefly earlier, is that, you know, this book is really about trying to tell a story. You know, the story is about, you know, what happens to Guahan, you know, and the people living there, you know, during this time period. And it, the, my, really my goal is to like, just show people that there was a, you know, a different way of, of living that 
still that you know even today there's there's aspects of it that still exist today, but um, there was a different world, right? Basically, before uh, what happened uh, before World War II, and so um, you know that's part of the story I'm telling. But um, really, you know, my in this book, I argue. I mean, the argument is that you know, uh, Chumo, uh, that the militarization of the island, right, is based on a co-constitutive process that includes Chumo and um, other non-Chumo land dispossession, because we also have to acknowledge that, right, there was also Filipinos and other, you know, folk, Japanese, right, that were living on the island that also had their land dispossessed from the military. But, you know, basically, but the majority, right, obviously being Chamorro. So Chamorro land dispossession, you know, um, and the constitutive process of, you know, the recruitment of several thousand laborers that came to the island. So once again, right, thinking about the infrastructure of the process of like, you know, militarization. And so, you know, these Filipino uh, uh, these workers, most like uh, most of them coming from the Philippines, you know, several thousand from the Philippines, mostly men, and also right a smaller um, uh, number, but also you know within the thousands, these white American workers that were coming, right, many of them coming from the south, and so um, you know these two groups make up the majority of the work of uh, the workers that come in after the CBs leave, right, after the majority of the CBs leave, and they're the ones that are basically continuing the building of the bases and the roads and these other things, right? That these other, you know, forms of bases as David Vine says all throughout the island. And so, um, you know, throughout the book, I also talk about how this process though included other things like the discursive, you know, element of it. So this, this is also the era in which we see, um, you know, this kind of idea of uh, modernity and militarization or the military becoming synonymous. So when people start thinking about like, you know, the military, you know, this, in this time period, it's also uh, depicted in American periodicals and in, in the continental United States as the military being this, you know, been, uh, this benevolent, you know, power, the U.S., I'm sorry, the U.S. Mil the right military being this benevolent, you know, institution of bringing modernity to the island. Look at their building modern roads. You know, like you could see that in the Life magazine, that um, article, there's two of them, but one of them in particular, the one from like July 1944. Um, Hope Cristobal shows it in um, in uh, Insular Empire. She kind of features it momentarily in that uh, documentary. But in that um, in that article, it's, it shows, right? It, it, it makes it, you know, um, synonymous. It says like, you know, look at all these, you know, lights and roads and things that they're doing that are they're modernizing the island. But we have to remember, all of those things are done for the benefit of the military. You know, Marine Corps Drive, the major, the major, you know, uh, uh, the major and widest and most modern road, um, you know, that was built at that time was to connect the two bases. You know, it was not made, you know, to make, you know, travel smoother, or easier, or faster for Chamorros. It was for the military to be able to, you know, mobilize and move soldiers and move equipment and and vehicles, you know, between. The naval base, right, and you know, and you know, through Tizen, and then through you know Air Anderson Air Force Base, right. It was like that was like part of that process. So um, that's one of the chapters where I talk about that, and then um, in another chapter that also is a, a, a large part of this uh, story is um, you know the interracial and interethnic relationships that emerge, in, interracial relationships that emerge um, as a result of all this militarization going on, because obviously. We have, you know, all these Filipinos coming in, also these white American, uh, white American, you know, workers coming in, and we have these different kinds of, as uh, Nicolin, uh, Nicolin Woodcock calls, these militarized intimacies that emerge. But see, for me, I look at intimacies in a variety of ways. Intimacy just doesn't mean like romantic relationships. Intimacies, intimacies also include like violence, right? Like and like that itself it can also be a certain type of intimate inter in, in encounter. And so, you know, these are the kind of ways that I'm looking at it. And then finally, um, the book ends, or, and I have a chapter on like, you know, uh, Filipino um, and the laborers experience that happens in Guahan, you know, like the ones that are building the bases, the Chamorros that are involved with that, the Filipinos that are involved with that. And then finally, I have this final chapter where um, I look at the history of Tizen as a, as a, as a case study for, you know, bringing together all those themes of the book. So the land, the labor, the interracial relationships, the discourse, they all all come together in looking at the history of Tizen. So um, that's kind of like the overview of the book. 
And in some ways, the book also attempts to, in a more academic way, right, try to, I try to make uh, contributions to different um, fields of study, right? That's one thing that we always do, right, in academia is always trying to make our work legible to other um, fields. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is a, as I hope is a contribution is to thinking about like settler colonial studies. So, you know, one of the things about settler colonial studies is always, you know, uh, this emphasis has always largely been upon places in which indigenous people are the minorities in their homelands. And rightfully so, right? Rightfully so, that is the, the, the usual focus. So places like, you know, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Hawaii, right? Um, Australia, these are places in Oceania, right? That are largely, you know, um, that are obviously the most associated with, you know, settler colonialism because of that reason. And like I said, rightfully so. But I also want to transform and re uh, or reorient how we look at, you know, what that process of violence is when we think about settler colonialism, because if, as indigenous people, as Chamorros, if we do acknowledge that, like, you know, we see the land, we see the ocean, we see um, the, uh, the land, the ocean, the sky as being part of our kin, right, as being kin to us, then anything that's done in violence and harm to those things are actually in violence and harm to us, right? And so um, that's where you know, that violence is being carried out through militarization is also, right, harming, harming us. And so it's not just the physical embodiment of humans, but also of our, you know, China, right, that is in the ground, the spirits that are, you know, in the jungles that get torn down, or, you know, the skies that are polluted and the ocean that's polluted. So, you know, through, mil uh, through militarization. And so those are like, all the, you know, the ways that broadly I wanted to like reorient how we then think about settler colonialism within this larger, you know, process of not just physical, but, you know, the physical, you know, changes of the demographics. So that's like one intervention. Another or uh, contribution, excuse me, other contribution I have is I try to also um, look at how Asian, Ameri Asian American and Asian labor is usually depicted in like Asian American studies, you know, so usually when we think about Asian American studies and Asian labor, it's around like unions, and political and political and political participation, right? Or um, also looked at through like plantation labor. So we're thinking about Hawaii, or we're thinking about Fiji, right? In these places, or Australia. But um, what you know, I'm hoping this contributes to that. There's into that um, then that field is to looking at like how Filipino um, workers and these and Filipinos are in Guahan also right have this kind of um, different narrative of not just being a plantation worker but being one that's you know directly um, directly um, entangled into the the process of uh, militarization and so you know as both right colonial subject though and also as settler right so uh, they're also a settler but they're also we have to acknowledge right they're also you know suffering through their own colonial um, experience as well, right? Especially if we're thinking about like right before World War II and after. So, um, yeah, so those are some of the uh, contributions that I hope that the, the project's making. And then, of course, uh, the final one is in studies on U.S. empire, because one of the things that's very common is that, and this is like one of those scale questions, right? <laughs> Come back to it, um, what I mentioned earlier, is that, in, um, you know, when it comes to looking at studies on, U on empire, U.S. empire, you know, People know, right? Like, you know, there's books out there like Daniel Emmerwar's book, right? How to Hide an Empire. Um, you know, there's work um, other scholars have written about, like, you know, how people understand Guam, you know, Guahan as like part of this, like, you know, strategic place in the Western Pacific. But what also makes Guahan strategically important is if we think about how its relationship to the US government is different from other places in the Western Pacific. And so, you know, one thing that makes Guahan so valuable to um, the U.S. government is the fact that the U.S. government owns the land in Guahan, right, that the military bases are on. And that's much different from when we're thinking about places like in the Marshall Islands, when that land is leased there, or, right, when we're thinking about the, you know, um, the, uh, the Northern Mariana Islands, right, like anywhere that's like a COFA, right, got a COFA um, agreement, like Compact of Free Association. Or if we think about then, if we expand further and we think about Asia, those bases that are located in South Korea, the bases that are located in Okinawa, all those bases are on land that are that the U.S. government does not own, right? Like, so there's a much different type of um, a power that the U.S. military and government can wield in a place when that land is owned 
versus when the land cannot be owned. And so that's where I think the, you know, that's where I think really the interest really lies, right? The U.S. Uh, the 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 interest lies for the U.S. government and the military is that they know those things. And so that's the way I also try to foreground that kind of understanding of Guahan within that larger kind of picture. Oh, sorry, Biba. I was really long-winded. No, and again, that's exactly what I wanted, Biba. <laughs> that's exactly what we want. Man, you touched on so much there. Uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight, though, was that I wanted, you know, when you were talking about, like, the construction of roads, you know, I know that you sent me this image and I used it, uh, I used it for the, I used it for our uh, flyer for this episode. Something as simple as roads, right? Mm -hmm. And how um, that these roads were created and these roads continue to be maintained primarily because of Guam's strategic value to the United States. And mm -hmm. so, you know, for, you know, for the position of the Chamorro in this space in which kind of the, the flurry of militarization, sort of like the glow of your strategic value creates some opportunities for you. I'll bet indirectly, right, in that Guam does receive per capita more than other territories of the United States in terms of federal spending because of its mili the military construction and the fact that, um, you know, the roads on Guam get used by the military, which means that the roads on Guam, federal, federal funds need to go into those roads. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I wanted to ask you your perspective on this because you know, one of the things that we find, though, is that similar to how, you know, people say Liberation Day, right? And that becomes sort of an argument for loyalty to the United States. Mm -hmm. But how far can you extend that? So if if the United States didn't invade Guam to actually save the Chamorro people, but it happened as a byproduct of that, that the Japanese were removed and the Chamorro people's lives got better, and the same with the roads, that if these roads were constructed and the Chamorro and other people benefit as a byproduct, how much loyalty do you ascribe for that? How much loyalty do you give that mm -hmm. if somebody is not really recognizing you and your needs and your value, but you just kind of get the scraps or you get the, you know, you just kind of to get you, you get what a, you know, the excess from it but it's not really about you. And so, you know, because uh, these issues that you're talking about, it's militarization and our relationship to the United States, it's one of those in which sometimes Chamorros feel that intimacy through their service, through their sacrifice mm -hmm. to the United States, but then also have to confront the fact that the United States is a massive country and it doesn't, the lives of a few Chamorros don't really factor the service of a few tomorrows don't really mean that much in the larger sum of things in the United States. And so I wanted to get your, you know, your thoughts on that. I, I, I spent a little while looking at this picture too, of the construction, you know, the post-war construction on Guam, but what are your thoughts on that? I, th I think like, you know, roads is one of those ways, right. And as, as one of those you know examples of infrastructure where we can see, you know, um, settler militarism really at work, right? And so and what I mean by that is like, so, you know, one of the things that the book is, that one of the theoretical frameworks that I use for the book or the, the primary one is Julian Nebelon's, you know, idea of like settler militarism, the way that settler colonialism and militarization, you know, conceal, hide, mask one another, legitimize one another. And so, you know, when, um, when I was reading about that and thinking about Guahan, you know, I thought that, you know, it is a theoretical framework that really does speak um, to a lot of what's happening. Like, and, you know, especially when we think about roads, because roads, right, um, you know, are one of those things where even today, right, the, the main, that main road that we talk about is, and everyone knows about is Marine Corps Drive. It's called Marine Corps Drive, you know, so, um, but at the same time, you know, we don't, or we aren't always, you know, taught about that history of how that road even came to be, you know, like that, it's just almost like that road has always been there, you know what I mean? Like, that's the, the kind of sensibility behind that, like that, that space. And so, you know, I think that's part of what settler militarism does, you know, it does all these different things, right? Like, as Juliet Neblon says, 
but it also naturalizes and makes things just kind of like, oh, that's how it's always been. But there's this process. There's this. Um, there's a struct. There's a structural force at play where you know the naming of this road that you drive on it every that you might drive on it every day and you know, to call it Marine Corps Drive, just a reminder. It's a start, it's always like this constant reminder for, I think for, you know, tomorrow's and anybody else, right? Not just tomorrow's, but anyone else that, you know, might have, you know, lived on Guam for a long time, you know, and has not known parts of the history or the stories of World War II and of liberation as a reminder, right, of the quote unquote sacrifice of the of the U.S. military. And so it kind of goes back though, like my critique, so like uh, I was kind of mentioning earlier, is not about like, like tomorrow individual, you know, um, individuals, you know, or anyone, you know, individuals that are in the military, it's more about this structure of power, you know, because the structure of power is really is what, you know, has a lot to do with the choices that people are making, you know. Um, one of the common things that we see, you know, when it comes to like military service, even in, in the continental U.S. or, you know, back in the Marian Islands or in like Samoa, right, or Hawaii, is that a lot of times people are struggling, people have financial hardships. You know, and even at one point when I was a young person, you know, um, I even thought about joining the military at one point, you know, just because I thought that it'd be like the easiest way to, you know, be able to um, be financially stable, you know. And so, um, but, it, but it, you know, with all those things said, right, to come back to it, it really um, is about looking at how, um, you know, these roads are like symbols of that, like it's examples, they're, they're, they're examples of that, you know, settler militarism dynamic at work. So. You know, I don't know if I, yeah, sorry if I didn't answer your question, but. No, Sidus Masi, Sidus Masi. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about just sort of your, the process by which you researched your book and then also wrote the book, right? Because, uh, you know, a number, you know, many people eventually put together a thesis or a dissertation, but far fewer make that, take that jump, you know, to eventually turning it into a book. And so, can you share a little bit about what your process was like researching in the, the dis, but then how long did it take you and how how fun was it uh turning, you know, transforming it into into a book? Okay. Um yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, you know the, you you know you remember what that roller coaster ride is like of graduate school and dissertation writing is. And uh what I mean by roller coaster is that, you know. Um, I always felt like every week brought some kind of new emotion. Some weeks were really highs and you were excited. And some weeks, you know, I remember I wanted to quit. I was like, I don't think I want to, you know, continue with grad school. But, um, you know, I think once I got to the researching phase, it was overall just exciting to be able to, you know, do the research, to get into these archives. But for me, more, uh, just as importantly, you know, the work I did, you know, the research I did was also allowed me to reconnect, you know, with my Chamorro side as someone that never, you know, that wasn't born on Guahan, someone that, you know, didn't, you know, didn't like visit Guahan as a young person for a variety of different factors that um, reasons why, you know, I haven't talked about yet. I haven't got a chance to talk about, but, um, you know, the work I did was not just professional or academic or intellectual it was actually really personal, you know, because they gave me a chance to reconnect with the side that, you know, um, of, of my family that um, I didn't be able to do before. Now, granted, like my father's side had always been, you know, part of like where I grew up um, in Southern California. They've always been like, you know, my life as a young person, but to be able to go back to write like the home, you know, the, the you know, Guahan is like a different experience that, you know, um, something that I think all Chamorros should be able to have an opportunity to do. And so that researching was really fruitful in that way because I got to reconnect with family while I was also doing all this research. And to also, and most, and just as importantly too, is the doing the oral history interviews, being able to interview um, elders and ancestors and man, the Manamco that, you know, were able to share their stories with me and tr entrusted me with their stories. So, you know, the researching part, you know, it had its highs and lows. But mostly it was just highs because I was able to do something that I wasn't able to do before, which was to reconnect. And I think, um, you know, when I finished graduate school, you know, I had four really long chapters, you know, but I didn't have that fifth chapter on Tizen. That was chapter didn't exist and it's not, it doesn't exist in the dissertation. Um, and the settler militarism and native survival, like through Custom Bridge Chamorro and through Chamorro land stewardship. That stuff really didn't exist in that kind of um, very, um, I guess, uh, more nuanced way. 
those were the, all the things I had to tease out when I was transforming the dissertation into a book. So one of the things that I, um, you know, realized from the help of my committee members and also what I um, learned about when I was workshopping the book was that I, the biggest hole that I had in the, uh, um, in, in the book was that I didn't have a really strong theoretical framework that linked all the chapters. And so that was my largest challenge. You know, I think I did enough, I did a lot of research, right? And you know this too, you know, I did research in all the archives in Guahan pretty much. Did, did the research in all the, you know, national archives in the US. I even did research in the Philippines, you know, like I went to the Philippines, did research in the Philippines. So like in terms of archival work and, you know, interviewing people, I did pretty much as much as I could, you know, within the time and finances that I had. But it was really that part of the book that I needed to tease out better. And so, um, you know, it was just, you know, being able to have it workshop, being able to get uh, feedback, and that's what I think. And then write that fifth chapter on Tizen. That's where I think things started really coming together. And so, the entire process. You know, I finished in 2015. You know, I was working and adjuncting. The um, book was probably um, from 2015 to like 20, probably 20, 2021 was probably when I was still like when I was probably much done with it. So, you know, trying to balance family, balancing working, it probably took me another like, you know, five to six years before it was like finally at a place where it was pretty put together. But um, it took through, a, it went through a lot of steps of revision. Like that was what I needed. You know, the book, uh, the dissertation needed a lot of revision. Even when it was ready for book, I had it be revised. I did a workshop. I even did my own workshop where after I had revised the dissertation myself once, I actually workshopped it with um, several faculty members, some of them my colleagues at my home college. They gave me, you know, a lot of feedback and with also two external reviewers. Um, I mean, two, two or three um, reviewers outside of my campus, senior scholars who had you know, published books already. So I did another workshop with like five or six different uh, pieces of feedback. Then I revised that whole thing again, and then I finally sent it to Cornell. So, but the thing is, when I pitched it back to Cornell, I said, hey, I've already revised, I've already workshopped this thing on my own time. Like I, you know, paid for it to have workshop and gave on a RAM to these folks who, you know, put their time and labor into giving me feedback. So I said, this is like, this is like some of the best that you're going to get. And then, um, you know, they accepted it, which was great. They sent it out for external review. Then the two external reviewers that gave me feedback gave me such great feedback. It was incredible feedback. But once again, Baguette, right? I had to do another round of revisions. And so, you know, I think that's the biggest part of the hey. book, the book <laughs> process is the, is the, just the constant revisioning. That's, I think that's the, I think that's the trip up that a lot of people end up having is just the being able to find enough time in your work, family, and any other type of obligations you might have to balance all that, to be able to put the time in for revising is I think the, the, the challenge. So, yeah. I'm glad that you did it, though. I'm glad, and I'm glad that you had so much support uh, in the process. In the process, so I did want to, you know, um, I do remember when you were doing your dissertation research and you came to Guam and you spent some time with my grandfather, the late mm -hmm. Tuhan, a, a master blacksmith, uh, a cultural master mm -hmm. here on Guam, and so I did want to just ask because um, as as I get older, I've lost both of my grandparents now. And so uh, mm -hmm. I love if anyone has any stories sort of about about uh, about them, I'd love to hear them. And so what was it like uh, when you met my grandfather? Well, you know, Saitamasi, thank you again for also encouraging him to allow me to interview him because, you know, that was, I know, a big part of him even, you know, meeting with me, you know, obviously has a lot to do with the fact that you and I are close. And so, um, no, I, it was really great because you know, everyone knows him as the uh, master blacksmith, like you said, like that is something that everyone knows, but I don't know how more, I don't know though, if people also know though, like he was like in one of the first tomorrow immigration officers on Guahan, you know, that's probably a fact that people don't know as well, right? Um, as him being the master blacksmith. And so, you know, um, I interviewed him. It was, it was good, you know, um, I, of course, you know, he was, you know, filling me out a little bit, I feel like, you know, just kind of see what he wanted me to, you know, he was wondering, like, you know, what story, you know, I was like seeking from him. But, um, you know, the main story that he's told, right, um, then it, that the one that he made into the book was the one where he talked about how, like, there'd be these Filipino, you know, workers who would be trying to, like, you know, gain permanent residency, and they would be claiming that they were married to these Chumwa women, 
And he and in the book, right? I don't know if you read that one already, Miguel, right? But he says like, oh yeah, there's this one Filipino woman that I brought he uh, no, one Filipino worker that brought this woman in, this Chamorro woman in. And I said, oh, you brought your grandmother in, and he was like, no, it's my wife. <laughs> and he was like, oh, what? He was like, oh, I don't know about that, you know, like. He himself, you know, like kind of chuckled about it because he was just like, yeah, there was like those kinds of things that happened. And so um, that was one story that, you know, I thought was like, wow, that's a really great anecdote that needs to get into the book. So that one made it in. And there was other ones too, but they just weren't within the scope of the book. So the other story that was really poignant, but um, because it just wasn't what the book was about, it didn't make it in. was The one where he talked about processing Vietnamese refugees at Anderson. And he said that like one of the things that that just was like blew his mind away was that the first wave that were coming off those airplanes, like those were some of the most wealthiest and privileged um, Vietnamese that were coming into the island. And he remembered when he was processing them, some of them had like briefcases of gold. That's what he said. Like they literally had like gold in their in their briefcases because right, many of the Vietnamese that came in that first early first wave, they liquidated all their cash into like things that were like stronger commodities like gold, right, or silver things that they knew that would be able to be sold much more, you know, be able to be used, right, as a way to, like, sell and make money versus, like, you know, Vietnamese money, which is not going to have any, right, any um, currency within the U.S., right, the same way that gold would. So that was the thing that I remember, too, that I was like, oh, if this book was, you know, had a chapter on Vietnam, maybe it would, you know, uh, make it in. But um, that was, you know, obviously that's not one of the sections of the book. So. Oh, seduce so Masi. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, you know, my, when I was, uh, you know, when my grandfather was alive, I would sit down and talk with him and so often. And it was interesting because before he died, he really, he made me promise that like I would, I would write a, a book or something about him. But for him, it was really like he wanted the cultural aspects. He wanted the blacksmithing stuff foregrounded. He wanted people to remember because there's probably there may be a time in the near future where no one makes traditional tools anymore and mm -hmm. where people don't appreciate them anymore. And so he really wanted that foregrounded. And so even when I would try to talk to him about his life as an immigration officer, it was hard to get stories out of him, you know. So I'm glad that you were able to get some some stories about him, because even for me, he would be coy about it. And mm -hmm. and eventually, after talking to more people, I learned that part of it too is just uh, what what Robert Underwood calls kind of a Guam's addiction to foreign labor is just that that my grandfather was somebody who like wanted Guam, who was on the front lines and kind of hoped that our local leaders would develop our own workforce more because I do remember him sometimes telling me like, man, you know, when he would see like a rich Chamorro who's like, who's like a politician or saying, yeah, you know, I remember when that guy had a business and they wanted to bring in all these people to be waitresses. And he would say they can't hire Chamorros for that. They couldn't hire locals for that. And yeah. so he would say those things. And then later, after talking to others, such as Robert Underwood, he would say part of this is that issue where, you know, that and this is, you know, your book, Bringing Together Militarization and Immigration. Um, it's an important thing for us to discuss because Guam is this place in which, you know, we rely on cheap foreign labor to build bases, but also to build civilian projects, to build houses mm -hmm. and, and, you know, residential areas, commercial areas off base. And so what is, and so for my grandfather, I know part of it too was just him feeling like, what he what he had felt at, at a certain point in his life that it had been completely lost in the shuffle and yeah. that people rather than building up the island and building up sort of local workers had just continued to just bring in foreign labor because it's cheaper and it's easier than dealing with local labor and so yeah so I appreciate you uh you and, know oh go ahead go ahead no that, and that's part of the reason why right the book stops at 62 is because you know the kinds of infrastructure that's being built after, you know, the uh, lifting of the security clearance is really a different kind of era than right in, in Guahan's history. That's where we see more of the, like you said, right, the Filipino and other civilian workers that are brought in to do more of like, you know, um, like more infrastructure building that's like for civilians, right, like for civilian use, like new homing, uh, new 
housing tracts and these kinds of other things, right? So um, that's like one component of it. But then two, you know, the other thing about your uh, grandfather, you know, that I think about too, is that he was, you know, I mean, I can see maybe some of his reservation or hesitation in like telling a lot of those stories because I also wonder to a certain extent that, you know, he was in a very precarious position, you know, he, right, as being one of the first Chamorro immigration officers, you know, had to, you know, write and straddle this line of like, you know, of, you know, following like law, right, following his duties as an immigration officer, but then also, right, like trying to balance like what his own community is going through, you know what I mean? Like he, so, you know, like, that's that's a tough that's a tough position to be in you know to like also like say okay i am a uh you know a, a representative right of the federal government in the sense that i'm an immigration officer but then also too right having to balance that like you know he's also a person from the community he's a person that you know loves his community and you know loves his culture and loves you know um tomorrow's right so that's a that's a tough position to be in you know so i can see also too maybe that might be i mean i don't want to read into it but I can only imagine that's not easy to like have to remember either, you know, have to, yeah, to, no. you know, talk about. Because at first there was a time when like, uh, you know, because when I would take my grandfather around and, and he would see people who he had helped with their immigration, you know, with their their permanent residency on Guam, you know, and they would always say, oh, Mr. Lujan, hello. And, and the thing is that, you know, my grandfather really he seemed to believe like you know what if you're a good person if you want a better life sure but he also was frustrated at those above him whether they were local leaders or whether they were federal leaders who didn't seem to give a crap about what happens to guam or the Chumor people so it was important because at first sometimes i thought oh maybe he doesn't you know he doesn't want to appear to be racist against filipinos or something because that was what happened in the in the first gubernatorial election with Joaquin Ariola is that he tries to argue, I will protect foreign workers, or I will protect local workers, we'll, we'll cut down immigration. And that kind of sets the stage for politics on Guam to then be that you, you can't ever talk against local workers because Ariola is lambasted for that. Um, mm -hmm. But so then, but I realized that my, you know, for my grandfather, it was, it was not that he had anything against the Filipinos, but it really just was that they they deserve their chance. But there's also people that are elected or that control the island, and they should be doing better. They should be doing better than just kind of this, you know, than the policies that are in place. But oh, sorry, Makana is here with me. He's Malongo. He's it's okay. He's, it's okay. But. My goodness, we could, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning so much, and I hope that other people are learning so much about these issues. And um, thank you for mentioning, because I was going to ask you why you had ended it in '62, but it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense, you know, because the lift, yeah. the security clearance. Now, I do want to give you a final chance here to share after finishing this book, you know, uh, and kind of gaining, gaining a deeper understanding of this history of our island and our people more than most, kind of what what lessons or what thoughts do you have, you know, for those who are, you know, for those who want to know more about this and, and especially are thinking to the future, the future of the island and the people, mm -hmm. what thoughts do you have to share? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, those, that message, um, you know, might differ depending on who you're asking, right? Whether you're asking tomorrow's or not tomorrow's or are you living in the diaspora are you living you know in Guahan and so um, I think the biggest thing is just to um, know you know that even in the in the even in the face of these you know massive structures of power like the U.S. military right that tomorrow's you know exist they existed before they existed after they exist after and the various ways that you know those um, cultural practices that custom bring tomorrow whether it's through you know, relationships with each other, whether it's the relationships with the, the land, the ocean, the sky, right? Those things all exist and continue, right? There's that continuity. And that continuity um, might not look exactly the same for every single person or every single, indi um, every individual or every family or every community, but there's ways in which those things are still, right? Um, still um, existing. The, the ways that those things are still 
um, functioning. And so that is probably the, the, the big takeaway that I hope that, um, you know, people take away from not just the book, but also the way that they even, you know, think about Guahan and, you know, the people who live there. And like I say, you know, Chamorros and everyone else, because we have to remember at the end of the day that everything that happens to that island isn't a Chamorro only issue. It is everyone that it, it is everyone who lives there. That's it's all their issue in some kind of way. Like I said, sometimes more directly and, or sometimes more indirectly, but nonetheless, right? Like those are things that we all have to be concerned with. You should give you, you know, um, that we should all be concerned with. But those are like the two things that, you know, I, I encourage people to, to think about and, you know, to find their own ways to, you know, explore those things, you know, whether it's through, you know, language classes with you or with, you know, listening to the Fanatsu podcast or, you know, going to Guampedia. Guampedia is such a great resource to find stuff that you and many other of our, you know, um, local, um, I, um, local, uh, like, like many of our, you know, fo folks back, you know, home have authored, right? Like a lot of the different essays that are on there. So there's so many ways to learn and to reconnect. And, and yeah, I just want someone to, I just hope people do it in some kind of way. Biba, Biba. All right. Sidzus okay. Masi, now I want to, I want to share your book one more time. And so remember that you can, uh, it is on if you get you can get it on Amazon, but if you get it on Cornell University Press, and I believe it is 09 EXP40 is the discount code. And so put it in, show your love, your Gwenaiza Nai, para that's <laughs> Alfred, you know, show your support. It's a great book. You've just heard what you've heard today is just kind of uh, some of the broad strokes of it. But when you really get into it, it's really connecting a lot of the issues that need to be connected. Um, I've heard, you know, as we've been talking today, I've, you know, I've been thinking about some of the works of some of our, our friends and our allies, such as Josephine Ong, Christian Oberiano, who are, you know, working on settler colonialism in Guahan from other angles. And so it just, uh, it's, it's, it's such a, your book is such a great part of that emerging conversation. Again for once again for your support and having me on and um, thank you else too, thank you everyone too for who might be tuning in and forgiving me for my rambling of uh, at 10 at 11 p.m at night and the west coast on the you know, pacific time <laughs> post kids going to bed so thanks everyone for their for your kindness and understanding in my ramble and my rambling so um, <laughs> but um, yeah thank you everyone Sidus masih tak lu, primud zat sidus masih new hamzu terus new mega perlu mega kungok. Esti ki fenak puri, esti episode fenak so, adjust esti ki mana lihat tak lu.